Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the No Trade Clause podcast. My name's Anil. I'll be your host today. I'm, all, I'm joined here uh, with Oliver as well from uh, part of the No Trade Clause team. And our guest today, uh, we're very happy to have him, in New York's very own CP the Franchise. CP, thanks for joining us. Yeah, fellas, happy to be here. I, I've been working with Oliver for, you know, quite a few, quite a bit, and he, he's come highly recommended. So when he invited me on the show, man, it was a no-brainer. So happy to be on the platform. Awesome, man. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's jump right into it. Let's talk about the Knicks. Let's talk about the offseason. Let's talk about what we're expecting for this upcoming season. Let's start with their, their large, their major offseason signing, Jalen Brunson. So Jalen Brunson signed a four-year, $104 million contract with a player option in year four. Yeah. Obviously, Jalen Brunson's coming off a pretty good playoffs. Um, he, was, he was averaging over 20 points a game. The Dallas Mavericks uh, advanced to the conference finals. Um, how do you feel about that signing, yeah. both the contract, which starts at $27.7 million and declines each year, yeah. as well as the on-court fit for the team? Yeah. Well, as a player, look, we haven't had a point guard like that in the last 10 years. You know, we've been desperately searching for an answer to that position. Last year, we ran Alec Burks at the point for most of it because the Kemba Walker experiment flopped. I mean, it was a worthwhile risk to take, but it just didn't work out. So they had to move on from that. They had Burks running the position, very slow to get into their offense. Wasn't a guy who, you know, that, he, Alec Burks, he's a utility guy. He's a jack-of-all-trades type of guy. You want him more as a scorer not as a point guard. And so the offense, I thought, really fluttered because you didn't have enough playmaking there. You know, with Brunson, he's going to give you some playmaking, but he's also going to give you high percentage shots inside the, ar inside the arc, which is something that the Knicks also haven't had. If you look at Julius Randle and R.J. Barrett, they're two inefficient scorers. They don't finish well at the rim. Jalen Brunson is at the top of the league in terms of uh, inside the paint efficiency, the floater, the mid-range game. You know, he's going to play very well off of the pick and roll, which is what Dallas ran, and Tom Thibodeau is going to run that as well. So Tibbs wants a guy that's going to get downhill, attack the basket, and spray it out from there. And so I think Brunson's going to help get you that, but then he's also going to get help get you some buckets. Now, as far as the contract, you know, a lot of fans wanted to argue that it, it was quite the premium to pay for a guy who was largely a backup for most of his career, not an all-star, and, and may not be an all-star as far as the ceiling is, is concerned. But, you know, listen, in, in this league in free agency, you're going to have to pay to play. You're going to have to pay a premium, and that contract slates out to be around the 15th highest amongst uh, point guards. So, I mean, it, it's, it's not a terrible contract. You're going to have to pay for that position. And I think he will help this team. I think he's going to help this team, especially on the offensive end, in the half court, and in transition. Also, you have to like the fact that in most of the contracts in free agency, they're declining. So they're, they're, they're trying to save themselves some salary cap space in the future to make future deals. So uh, look, all, overall, I think it's a positive move. Gotcha. And another guy uh, who's been with the organization, um, for his uh, his whole career, who you were fortunate enough to bring back, Mitchell Robinson, signed four years, $60 million. His case is particularly interesting because he was picked up, up off of a team option going into this season. And had New York declined that team option, he would have been restricted. But they picked it up, and then he entered unrestricted free agency. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a gamble, right, from the Knicks, yeah. <laughs> you know, lose, giving up some of that control. Um, why do you think the team made the de that decision last year, and are you happy with how things ultimately panned out? Yeah, well, it was a tricky situation, right, because you didn't want to risk losing him for nothing mm -hmm. because that made you think, well, did they have something potentially to trade for him at the trade deadline that they passed up on, and then mm -hmm. ultimately do you lose him in the offseason? So that would have been a big, big loss for the Knicks. Um, ultimately bringing him back, you know, in the four-year 60, again, it's a premium for a guy who, you know, 48% at the free throw line, doesn't really have much of an offensive package, but he's very important to that Knicks defense. He's the anchor of that Knicks defense. He cleans up a lot of mistakes for them defensively and also on the offensive glass, one of the best offensive rebounders in the league. So he's going to clean up a lot of their mistakes. And as I said, when you have inefficient uh, scorers like RJ, like Julius, you're going to have a lot of bricks you got to clean up. And, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's Mitch's game. I hope that with the addition of Brunson and better overall point guard play, maybe we get Donovan Mitchell in here. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that, uh, you know, elevate Mitchell Robinson's game a little bit because you want to see him uh, excel a little bit offensively. Does he have, you know, a little go-to move three to five feet away from the basket where you can rely on him to, yeah. uh, you know, get some putbacks for you? So mm -hmm. overall, I think it was a good move. Yeah, just really quick, there was some talk about um, potentially just getting a one of those replacements uh, from the draft yep. to replace Robinson. Was that something 
you were interested in the Knicks doing, or were you ju were you happy with just retaining him and paying yeah. him that chunk of change? You know, I, I, I was happy with going that route. Yes, there was a possibility that they could have went with the Jalen Duran mm -hmm. or a, uh, a Mark Williams who ended up going to Charlotte, resetting those rookie contracts, and, and having some, you know, good prospects at the five. I just didn't feel like I wanted to go that way with, with the team in the draft. I was looking for either a point guard option, which there wasn't many, or somebody on the wing who could add to the depth in the roster. So mm -hmm. I rather than stay with Mitchell Robinson, continue to develop him. Again, decreasing, descending contract. And in the future, if there's a trade that makes sense or, or something that can make the team uh, better, then, then you move him or you, you keep him during that contract. Awesome. Yeah, I want to just point out one thing with descending salaries that people may not be aware. So obviously it's uh, very advantageous to the team from a, a future salary cap flexibility perspective. Mm -hmm. Now, the one downside of it is with his salary declining. So in four years, his salary is going to be 13 million. If they want to extend him, the max, ex the max uh, salary in year one of his extension would be 15.6 million. Mm. So that's a bit limited because if he outplays that, it's going to make it difficult to, for them to sign to an extension. Yeah. It's a future problem, yeah. but it was something that based on Zach Levine's uh, salary, him signing an extension last year didn't make sense because it would undervalue uh, mm. what, he, what he was worth. So just right. something to keep in mind, but yeah. I do like that they got descending salaries for both Brunson and Mitchell Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, wanna want to shift gears here a little bit yeah. to uh, a player that hopefully is a budding star for your team, potential franchise player for this team, the former number three pick, uh, R.J. Barrett. So R.J. Barrett right now, he is uh, extension eligible uh, to sign his rookie scale extension. We saw uh, Zion Williamson. We saw Darius Garland. Uh, we saw John ja Morant. They all signed five years, 193 million. Um, and if they make all NBA, that number can increase uh, beyond that as well. Yeah. What are you expecting to see from RJ Barrett? What do you want them to sign him for? Yeah. Is that max contract too much? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, what you have to love about R.J. Barrett is in each of his three years, he's improved statistically. Uh, now, the efficiency numbers are a big question mark, right? Mm -hmm. You know, from three, from inside the arc, it, it hasn't been great. He's been 75% from the free throw line, so you have to love that. You know, 11 games this past season of 30-plus or more, or 30 or more, after the All-Star break, he was averaging around 24 and 6. So he's improved. He wants the ball in his hands. He wants to be a leader for this Knicks organization. We picked him number three in the draft. I think it would show a sign, show the fans and, and uh, the NBA at large that, you know, this, this team does have some stability. They do want to continue to develop and invest in a person who they can call a franchise player, maybe not as the best player on the team, but someone who can represent the organization. So I think that that's a good move. Now, again, to give him the full max, I believe it's what, five years, 180. It's five years, 193. 193. So that starts at 33 million, yeah. going up to 44 million. Yeah, see, that, that's a little bit tricky. I don't think I would go that high. I think I would go maybe about five, 150. The guys you named, John Morant, Darius Garland, Zion to a lesser extent. If you look at Michael Porter Jr.'s deal, a lot of those deals, these teams were investing in uh, what they are right now. In the case of Morant and Garland, you have all stars. Like, you know what you have or what they could be in the future, what their ceiling is. For R.J. Barrett, I think that largely depends on can he improve his efficiency from the field? Yep. Can he uh, develop more of a pull-up jump shot? Can he be more efficient from the three-point line? You know, he's getting to the free throw. He got to the free throw line a lot more just to finish off the season, which is very encouraging. But I think it, it all depends on his, his shot-making and playmaking ability in terms of what his true ceiling can be. And so I think that's why it's a little bit tricky to invest the full max in him because I'm just not sure where his ceiling ultimately tops out at. So I would say 5150 is, is a number that I would be comfortable with. So before we move uh, move from RJ Barrett, I want to ask you a question. Are you happy with his development so far over the first three seasons, yeah. or did you expect more? No, I think so far I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm happy with it. I think in his second year, he was a lot more efficient from three, a lot more efficient from the catch and shooting. Uh, a lot of that was based off of Julius Randle's uh, playmaking, but that seemed to be an outlier. Now, this year, the numbers have come down a little bit. He did have the ball in his hands a lot more. The usage rate did go up a lot more. Uh, the defense has come down a bit. But this year, man, I mean, 46 points against a, a stout Miami Heat defense. Uh, the buzzer beater against the Celtics. As I said, 11 games is 30-plus. And you really saw where in late-game situations, he wanted the ball in his hands to be able to deliver for his team. And so, again, yes, you would love to see the numbers be a bit more efficient. But where I've seen him develop in his third year, overall, I think it's a positive.
Uh, another guy in the backcourt we, we want to touch on, Emmanuel, quickly. Yeah. You and I have done some work talk, going back and forth yeah. about uh, with him, whether or not he can assume like lead ball handler responsibilities. Yeah. We were cutting up some film, diving in on that. And now with Brunson coming in, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit. It changes the narrative. How, what do you see as Quickly's outlook heading yeah. into this season? How does the Brunson signing change that? Well, for one, we have to see if he gets dealt in a, in a Donovan Mitchell trade, yeah. right? And That's and that would be point. tough to see because as, yeah. as much as I would want Donovan Mitchell here, Manuel Quickly's a player who I, I've come to like uh, both uh, as a player and as a person. You know, very nice kid. And as a player, I thought we saw uh, a nice improvement overall as, as a floor general this past season. A lot of fans, before we brought in Jalen Brunson, were saying, why not just roll the dice with quickly as your starting point guard? It seems like the organization did not want to go that route. Uh, but as I said, I saw some improvements from him as a playmaker last year, especially as the season closed out. Um, you know, very, very instrumental in running that second unit, especially when Derrick Rose went out. Now, this season, upcoming season, if he's on the team, I think he'll assume that role as a sixth man with, if Derrick Rose is on the team, running that second unit. Again, it all depends on, on who's on that second unit, depending on the, if the Mitchell trade uh, goes down. But Quickly's role is going to be as a six-man, and he's going to be able to play on-ball or off-ball in his third year. I think he's, he's going to be a big asset to the team. So you touched on Donovan Mitchell. We'll get that to that in a second. I want yeah. to ask you a quick question about Julius Randle. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about Julius Randle coming into this season? Obviously, uh, two seasons ago, I believe he made All NBA. Yeah, he had a really great season. All Star, All Star, most improved. Most improved. He, yeah. he had a fantastic season. Yeah, last year was a bit of a step back. What are you expecting this season from Randall? You know, it's tough because you know, from the outside looking in, if you look on the stat sheet, a random observer sees Julius Randall twenty and nine. You're like, how? You know, how did this guy have a bad season? But when you looked on the court, uh, the effort on the defense wasn't there. His playmaking wasn't there. A lot of mistakes, a lot of turnovers, and again, coming off of that season that, that you just mentioned, it was disappointing. He went from 40% shooting from 3 to 30. I mean, he fell off a cliff completely. And so it really showed that that second season with the Knicks was really an outlier. And so, unfortunately, he, he struggled. I thought he, he struggled uh, with the pressure of losing and not having that success that, that, that they had two years ago, making a fourth seed in the East. There was a lot of adversity facing Julius Randle this past season. So, you know, I'm not really sure what to expect. The one thing you can expect from Julius Randle is that every season he's going to put in the work to get better. He was here at Summer League. He looks a lot more slim and, and trim, so he looks like he's getting in the shape early. It seems like he wants to rebound, but I'm not, just not sure what the future holds for Julius Randle and this organization because if he's not including in a, in a, in a Donovan Mitchell deal, the chemistry is going to be a question between a Julius, Brunson. If you bring in Mitchell, you have RJ. There's only one ball. Yeah. And so I have to see if Julius Randle is still here. Can he sacrifice for the betterment of the team, and can he still remain engaged if the ball's not on his, in his hands on both ends of the floor. The, the one thing is that we, we haven't had a player that can help make him better. And so there's so much pressure on him to deliver for the team. I think it, it's just put him out of position. That makes sense. Um, okay, let's get into Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's, it, the Knicks are, they seem like the favorite to land Donovan Mitchell. We're talking about a dynamic scorer. Yeah. One of the best in, in, the, in the league. I think he's got a career average of 24 points a game. But we're also talking about a bit of an undersized two guard. He's six yeah. foot one, and so that would make a backcourt of Jalen Brunson and Donovan Mitchell, who are both six foot one. Yeah. So there's some pros. Maybe there's some cons. Do you? How, how do you feel? Let's first let's talk about the upside of how do you feel if the Knicks acquired him? Yeah. Um, obviously, it depends on what they give out. But if they acquire him, what's the Knicks ceiling? How do you like that fit? I think it's a move that you have to make. You know, Leon Rose, Scott Perry, and that regime. They went out and they traded and they acquired all these draft picks to make a move like this. Now, is this the fit tricky with Brunson here? Absolutely. But I feel like with the Brunson acquisition, the Knicks are basically saying that they're not going to build this thing through the draft. They want to continue to compete and then acquire talent via trade by using some draft picks, a combination of draft picks and young players. And so if that's a strategy that they're going to take, they have to take a swing on Donovan Mitchell, even if it may not be a precise fit for them because the draft picks that they have right now, it's not gonna help them build a, a winning team with, with where they are with Brunson. And so it's either, if you're not gonna build through the draft, to me at the top of the draft, you have to take a swing here and try to acquire, you have a 25 year old all-star who's you know available. Those opportunities don't come all the time. And so even if they acquire him, I think they can still make, you know, 
sixth seed playing, but that's just a start. You know, you're not acquiring Donovan Mitchell right now to, to immediately contend for a title. You're bringing him in here now to continue to build with your team. Hopefully, R.J. Barrett becomes a better player, depending on who you give up. If you don't have to gut the depth of your roster, hopefully the younger players continue to improve. And then you see down the road, is there another trade that you need to make? Do you need to trade Julius Randle? Does Jalen Brunson uh, uh, net you something else? You continue to build, but now you have your franchise player or one of your franchise players. And so I think the, the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, absolutely, I do agree. So when we're talking about what the Knicks are going to have to give up, yeah. a package that works, Evan Fournier, quickly, top in, plus picks. Yeah. That package would work uh, from a salary matching perspective. I've heard some people say, would the Knicks be, be willing to trade R.J. Barrett? Yeah. So I'll ask you, what do you see as a realistic package yeah. uh, for New York to give up? Which players would you say I absolutely do not want to give up? And then draft capital-wise, yeah. Rudy Gobert fetched Utah five. Five, five first-round picks. The precedent might be set in the market of we got five for Rudy Gobert. That's where we're going to yeah. start the conversation for Donovan Mitchell. What do you think in terms of what the Knicks should or may have to give up? For me, R.J. Barrett's a deal-breaker because, as I said, you want to bring in Donovan Mitchell here with some talent. And I think R.J. Barrett is developing into that type of player who can be a two or a three of your big three, right? And, and can develop into that place. 21 years old. I wouldn't want to part with that for Donovan Mitchell because I think that that's a either lateral or backwards move, right? So R.J.'s off the table. You want to put Fournier in the deal to match the salary? Absolutely. Quickly and topping. Again, I love that dynamic duo. I love what they did with the Knicks second unit. You're going to have to pay to play. Yeah, to me, I think they top out as role players in, in this league. Now, with the picks, as you said, with Gobert, the precedent has been set. Danny Ainge is not going to settle here. And so I think, yes, they, they, they will intend to rebuild their team. And I think it's going to cost that much. Where the Knicks have an advantage, they have 11 picks with, within the next five years. They will still have some draft picks to continue to develop this team, even if they have to part with five, maybe six. It, it may take that much. But again, for, for, for a 25-year-old All-Star, you have to take that risk. I, I think it's a risk that you have to take. So our last question, really quick. Um, given everything that's happened so far and discounting everything that's in the rumor mill right now, the way the roster stands currently, what is your floor? What's your ceiling for the Knicks this season? Well, they were 37-45 and 45 last season. Uh, I think if they would stand pat with this team, with Brunson, I think they can get to say 42, mm -hmm. 42 wins. Floor, I'd say around the same. You know, it all depends on, again, it depends on the chemistry between Brunson, Randall, and Barrett. Because as I said, Barrett ended that season. He wanted that ball in his hands. Julius wants a ball in his hands. Brunson came here with the intention of having more uh, command of the offense. So those three guys, the chemistry of those three guys is gonna be pivotal to this team. Julius Randall improving is going to be a big if. And then overall, how does the team defense, how is it impacted with Jalen Brunson here? You lose positional versatility. That's one thing when you had with Alec Burks and even Alfred Payton to a lesser extent at your point guard spot. You had a bit more versatility if you had to switch on pick and rolls, if you had guys, you know, potentially in mismatch situations because those were bigger guards. With Brunson, you don't have that. And so, you know, it's going to depend on how the, how the defense plays. But I think ceiling, say 42, and floor, I'd say, keep it around 37. Gotcha. Yeah. So what is that uh, positioning in the East? Where do you yeah. think that'll land you this year? I think it's, I think it's playing contention. Okay. I think I think it's playing contention. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't I don't necessarily see the Brunson and Hartenstein deals as uh, something that's going to take this team up a notch. And the East, the East is still the East, mm -hmm. right? You have Chicago, you have to deal with. You have uh, the net. You don't know what the Nets are going to be looking like. You have the, obviously the Bucks, the Hawks, Dejounte Murray. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are improving. We'll see how uh, Charlotte does uh, with, with their improvement. So there's going to be a lot of teams that they're going to have to contend with. Uh, the Wizards as well. You know, Wizards are another tough team. And so I, I think it's still going to be around playing. Gotcha. Yeah. CP, love the conversation. You know, we haven't done too many team-specific podcasts yeah. before. And I really enjoyed this conversation. I think the Knicks are in a very interesting position. Uh especially with such a large market. Now they're getting back into the, into the discussion for some of these yeah. stars as well. So I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, before we, we head out, 
why don't you tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, so uh, YouTube.com slash KnicksFanTV. Also on all social media platforms, KnicksFanTV on Twitter, uh, Instagram. I'm also on Instagram on Twitter under CP the Franchise. So, fellas, definitely appreciate the time. And Neil Oliver, you guys do great work. As I said, he came highly recommended <laughs> to me by some big wigs in the NBA. And so uh, I, I trust the credibility and the judgment of this platform. Anytime you guys need me, I'm, I'm here and I'll be supporting. Appreciate, appreciate that, man. CP. Thanks for stopping by. And thanks, guys, for checking in another episode of the No Trade Clause podcast.